Commission on Monday, July 8th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. And Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board during the reception of visitors later on in the agenda. The board asks that anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over there to my right. All right, uh, we're gonna start off as always with our flag salute and our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, with that, let's get into it. We're going to start off with the spotlight on our schools, the 2019 Spring Data step Snapshot with uh, Justin Sissel. Thank you very much. We're looking forward tonight to taking a brief look at our spring data. We'll take a look at our map reading and math data, as we typically do, also our Ames web data, and have some preliminary discussion around these data points, just kind of some initial trends that we're seeing. Um, we'll also, for the first time, have a chance to look at our four of our six key performance indicators from the strategic plan. This is the first time that we have um, a new set of spring data since we've established those. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about a, a slight change in our map assessment procedures for next year. The other set of spring data that we will eventually discuss is the spring Illinois assessment of readiness data, which also attaches to those two remaining key performance indicators. That data is typically not available publicly until October. We've begun to see a little bit of preliminary data, but it is very preliminary at this point. So we're looking forward to reporting on that in the fall. So we'll begin with the Ames web data, and I'll just, with the first slide of each type, I'll take a moment to sort of really walk through what's there, and then we'll move relatively quickly through the remainder of the slides in that sequence. The goal is to have all of Real the information. Real quick, James, is there a reason that one's on? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so now you can see all of the data, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the goal is to have it all available for you, um, but, but to really just kind of highlight a, a few key items as we go through the report. So as we look at this set of data, this is our, our kindergarten class in the, in the fall of last school year, so at the beginning of the year, and there are three assessments that are given to kindergartners to uh, come up with what's called the total early literacy composite. And so as you look at the individual scores over here, the, the colors go from left to right, so the red and, and the yellow yellow are, are below average, whereas the greens and the blues are above. And then when we look at the composite, just to make it confusing, it goes, it goes kind of the other direction. So where our red, uh, our, the red bar there is our students who are most at risk, are, are at high risk, and the green are our students who are at low risk in terms of those fluent, those literacy measures at the beginning of the year. So what we're hoping is to see movement in that total composite from fall to spring. And so if you kind of keep your eyes there, then when we change the slide, you can see some pretty tremendous growth in terms of where our students were after a year of instruction. That really tells us that at the kindergarten level, based on that data, what we're doing is working. The intervention we're providing for our students who enter the year at, at higher level of, of academic risk is, is helping them to move into that lower level of risk and move further over to average. One other thing, and, and well beyond average, one other thing I want to highlight is just to look over here. So if you look at, um, for example, auditory vocabulary, that, that number there, we have to be careful the way we interpret that. In some cases, if you look, there are only actually three students to whom that assessment was administered. So there are, there are three of the assessments that are district-wide, and there are a couple of isolated incidents where an individual teacher or team of teachers might elect to administer an additional assessment to gain some additional data for individual students. When we pull the reports from Ames, it all shows up. So just as you're looking at that, if something seems skewed, look carefully to make sure that it's actually a representative of the entire grade as opposed to one or two students. So that was kindergarten from fall to spring. Similarly, the assessments are a little bit different. Here are our first graders beginning in the fall of last school year. So again, our attention drawn over here to that total early literacy composite. We see a, a nice high start on, on the green. And then when we get to fall, again, we see that um, that low risk area has grown tremendously. Again, here's a great example of where one or two students are shown in the auditory vocabulary and nonsense word fluency, so it, it looks like it's skewed. Really, it's just those two to the right, oral reading fluency and word reading fluency, that make up that early literacy composite for all of the first graders in the district. 
The last piece of district-wide Ames Web data that we look at is our second grade oral reading fluency, because as you'll recall, beginning in third grade, students who achieve a certain level of uh, oral reading fluency proficiency are no longer administered this benchmark, because they, with principal, reading specialist, and teacher approval, we agree that, that is, they've, they've now shown that they will be fluent readers. So here again, we have the colors to the left are, are, are below average, moving to the right well above average. These were our second graders in the fall. And then as we move to the spring, we see again those below and well below average numbers dropping significantly, whereas everything to the right is increasing. So again, this measure tells us that the, the intervention that we have in K2 in term, around literacy and fluency is, is really doing well by our students. Any questions around MeansWeb before I move on to the next set of data? I know that uh, when we get to the map data, we'll, we'll see the overarching results, but underneath the map data comes domain level results. Uh, AIMSWeb seems to provide similar domain level results. Does that end up getting used in classrooms as a during the year ac action to personalize for each student on one student might be struggling in oral reading fluency, another one might be struggling with nonsense words? Is that used similarly like NWA map domain level data might be? It is when, when we consider intervention and what kinds of supports we might be um, providing for students. So yes, I mean that is, that is part of the conversation and particularly in kindergarten and first grade it's probably even used a little bit more uh, heavily than some of the map domains are just because it really, they're, they're, much, they're much more specific assessments that give us that, that, that really, uh, that help us to identify which of those early reading building blocks are students struggling with or successful with. So moving into map data, we've become accustomed to the first slide being sort of a moment in time. So this is our spring data, also with some fall data next to it. And so I'll just take a minute to walk through from, from left to right what we're looking at. So the first five columns are achievement data, which really has to do with, at that point in time, how, how did our students perform? And so we have the fall and spring average or mean percentiles. Then we have the fall and spring median percentiles. And then those are pretty self-explanatory. And then finally, we have the, the, the spring 2019 achievement percentile. And again, this is the percentile that's derived from comparing our performance <coughs> to all other schools or districts or grade levels, however it, it, you cut it, that are also administered the MAP assessment. So whereas, just as a, as a reminder, we, we've often anecdotally talked about 70th percentile being high achieving. And that's, that achievement percentile really says that, for example, for our kindergartners, by achieving a 71st median percentile, that puts us in the 91st percentile of all the other schools that, and districts that administer MAP. Because again, individual students may have 99s and 1s, but an average isn't going to be 99 and 1. And so that has to do with why that range is a little bit different. So on those first five, we can really, again, we can look at growth across the board from our fall to spring percentiles, which is really exciting. Our, our reading achievement percentiles are in the spring are, are significantly high across the board. I mean, there's, there's 169 and everything else is above the 70th percentile of the median, which is absolutely a celebration. And, and the first question people will ask is, well, that's obviously because of our new reading curriculum implementation, right? And the answer is probably it's beginning to be. We're really only at the end of the first year of that implementation, so it's difficult to say that that's, a, that that's completely causal. We, we are hopeful to see those numbers continue to grow as the, the implementation is even more embedded and, and, and felt more comfortably for all of our teachers in the second year. So while we, can, we, are, we are excited about these numbers, we also want to be careful to say that Benchmark and Study Sync have given us these numbers in only the first year of full implementation. They're definitely a part of, of what, is, what is happening to show that growth. The last two columns to the right are growth data. And so the first, uh, or the second to, second to right from right is the percent of students who met or exceeded their growth projection from fall to spring. So again, MAP sets a growth target based on your fall performance. And so that's the percentage of students at each grade level who met that target or exceeded it in reading. That, you know, you could, you could meet it by one or you could miss it by one. So that's just one measure of growth. The other piece is that conditional growth percentile. And this takes a look at all of the kindergartners, for example, who started at the same point and measures where they, how far they grew as compared to that starting point. So when, again, when we look at comparing all of the kindergartners across NWA's norms and all of the, all of the kindergartners who have taken that assessment, uh, the growth that our students showed from their starting point puts us in the 98th percentile of all, um, of all kindergartners who took the MAP assessment. So then we walk through each of those data points from an historical perspective, and again, you can, you can read across horizontally to see what 
a certain grade level has looked like over the past now six years of map data that we have across the district. And then the color coding helps us to track cohorts to look at what happens to a group of students on the whole as they move through our system. So again, we've seen the past two years, we've had some significantly high achievement numbers in reading in, um, in these scores. <coughs> Looking at that achievement percentile, again, this is you know, where, where that median performance puts us in terms of percentile compared to other schools. Again, some, some all-time highs at a couple of grade levels and some significant strengths. We've had a couple of years now of strong performance here. The percent of students meeting or exceeding. This one tends to have the most variance through cohorts as we, as we move through both in reading and math. And again, that can have to do with how, how close to the target that number can be. And then again, that conditional growth percentile. So here's a, here, in, in some cases, we can see some, some jumps from where we were last year. And again, we're, we're, I am hopeful to be able to attribute that to all the work we've done with our, new, with our new reading curriculum. And that will bear out as time goes on. We'll move to the same um, look at our math data. The same areas are there. Again, in most cases, some, in most case, in all cases, growth. In some cases, the median percentile dipped a little bit from fall, but in those same cases, the mean percentile did move up a little bit. And so that's kind of why we do track both of those measures of central tendency, because they tell us slightly different stories. But looking at that fifth column again, the achievement percentile across the board, really, really very high. And looking at our conditional growth percentile, the far right column, again, very high in many, many cases, and we're going to focus more on that in the historical slide in just a minute. So again, tra tracking our math achievement, we're seeing some, some consistently high um, percentiles in, in many of our grade levels. Um, we know that uh, as students move through our system, we tend to see that, that growth certainly from about fourth grade to seventh and eighth grade as you start to watch most of the cohorts are gaining significant growth in those years. The same with the achievement percentiles, it tells a very similar story to the median performance. The percentage of students meeting or exceeding, this one, in, again, we, in any given year, you can see some variance between the cohorts, but in the past couple of years and toward the, toward the bottom, we're starting to see uh, some increase in those numbers, which is good. And the slide I want to focus on a little bit tonight is that conditional growth percentile. So if you'll recall, a year and a half ago, um, we, we spent some time talking about some pretty significant discrepancies, and, and they're here. Um, you can see them in, in I can use the, the pointer, in, in the second, third, fourth grade, for, for a couple of years, we were seeing numbers that were pretty discrepant from other grade levels that we had seen. And so in February of 2018, we went back to the math committee and said, let's, let's dig into this a little further, particularly in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And so when we look at the, the, the difference in those growth percentiles in third, fourth, and fifth grade this year, again, I'm gonna be cautious to say any one act is, is causal to a set of data, but I, I really do believe that the, the work our teachers spent over a couple of summers looking for supplemental material, providing it to everyone, it's an example of a way that we responded to data and, and did what we could. It, it, it still is important that we're on the path to a new core math resource. There's no question about that. But in the meantime, the work we've done has actually is, is benefiting the students who are currently in our system. So that, to me, is, a, is a, a pretty significant celebration. And so then if you're going to look at the celebrations, we also have to start to look at why is the eighth grade growth number so much lower across the board in some cases. When we compare it to where the eighth grade percentiles begin, we're, we're starting at a pretty high point. But that's something, that's one piece of data we haven't dug into recently. And so, you know, what, what is that telling us in terms of the kind of instruction we're doing? One thing to think about is that a lot of our eighth graders are taking high school equivalent courses, and the high school courses are um, you know are a little more integrated, whereas they're not focusing on any one particular subject. So it's just some some beginning anecdotal thoughts about what that might be. But that's a point we'll take back to the math committee, even in the midst of a, a new pilot experience, and, and talk through a little bit. Before we move past the map data specifically, any questions on on those slides that I can answer or speak to? I can go back later too if, it, if they come up. The new thing that we have this spring is the, the key performance indicators from our strategic plan. 
And so the first two that we set um, are at the, by spring of 2021, the median percentiles in, in map for reading, we set at 80% was our target. And so we began with where our baseline was last year. Our target for this year to move that up incrementally was the 75th percentile. And so that, that highlighted column shows our actual data this spring, some well exceeding 75, some a little bit under. If you average that, it's like 74.4. And so that puts us you know, on the whole in a pretty good, um, Pretty, pretty well in sight of those targets. We knew that 80th percentile would be ambitious, so we're gonna continue to, to watch that data as we go through and look specifically if there are places where we're consistently seeing uh, uh, slight dips just as we had with math in the past. Similarly with math, in this case, our key performance indicator sets the target at the 77th percentile based on where we began. And so this year, if you, if you average, we're looking at the 71st percent, percentile as a target. That average across our grade levels is about 71.3. So again, we're, we're right on track, but that means that we're going to need to realize um, some achievement levels that are a little bit higher for next year to keep us on track to that target. The other two key performance indicators we'll talk about tonight are the subgroup indicators. And our, our team that put this together a year and a half ago, this was right on the, on the, at the beginning of, of, of the ESSA-defined subgroups, which again are 20 or more students sharing demographic characteristics in a school who are state assessed. So in our case, we're really talking about third through eighth graders, kindergarten through second grade or preschool through second grade students don't factor into those demographics. Um, and we wanted to make sure that, that those students were achieving at least a year's worth of growth or better. So basically putting them on that 50th percentile national average for growth from their starting point, recognizing that if, if they're gaining more than a year of growth, then they are theoretically closing that gap in terms of where they might be discrepant in performance. And so what we have realized this year is that in, uh, in reading, 24 of 36 groups achieved that goal, and in math, 29 of 36 groups achieved that goal. And so this is new data for us. We haven't looked at, at the data in this particular way. Uh, we actually haven't had a chance to walk through this with our building principles yet even. I will tell you that the, the distance from 50% is not huge. It's, you know, it's between the lowest one is, is, is around the 42nd percentile. So we're not far off the mark even where we have missed. The other thing that is, um, if, there's a, if there's something to take comfort in that, it's that pretty much every type of every subgroup that we have identified in multiple schools falls into the category of not meeting. So for example, it's not just all of our IEP subgroups who aren't meeting that goal right now. One of them is an IEP subgroup. One, of is, a, one, one is a low income subgroup from partic a particular school. One is a Hispanic or Latino subgroup. And so while certainly all of those characteristics we know put students at risk and we want to, to focus some energy now on looking closely at who these students are in these schools and how we can better support them, um, we also, it, it, we know that there's not an easily identifiable gap that is consistent by demographic across schools. Great. Um, I think I, when I saw the 36 um, subgroups that was confusing for me for a yep. moment, but I think I figured out based on your explanation that we don't have 36 subgroups, but between all of our buildings, we might have a couple here, a couple here. Correct. Um, that add up to 36. That is correct. And, and in, in the interest of complete transparency, that does also include the subgroup at, at all 13 schools of white students because it right. is an ESSA identified right. subgroup. So when you factor, so there's some, some buildings might have five or six, some buildings might have one or two. Correct. Okay. And those, and those groups can change from year to year in, in a give, because of our model. In a given year, a school might have a particular subgroup because they have 20 or more students. If a large number of sixth graders happen to move on that don't have that shared characteristic or if students move to other communities, we can have different subgroups year after year. So that, that makes it much harder for us to kind of compare. Um, it's not as easy for us to go, all right, we had 29 this year. And then next year we have 27, but we may be out of 30, and, and they may be completely different. We're not really tracking a cohort when we're looking at this over an historical period of time. That's true. And in the background, we certainly are. I mean, we do know exactly which groups at which schools we're talking about. And, and you know, we can, we can break into that data a little bit further to see. Because the goal is really the subgroup categorizes a group of students who may be academically at risk because of a shared demographic characteristic. And so ultimately, when we work to support these subgroups, we're working to support individual students. So a couple of layers down, we, we can sort of track that in other ways. But this was, this was the, the, the broadest way we could come up with a goal to make, at the time to, make, to, to ensure that we were focusing not only on all students, but also on those at-risk groups. 
before we move on from the KPIs, can we go back a couple slides? Sure. Um, and when I first read this, I understand, you know, you only get so much context in a slide deck, but I think when we look at the actuals and kind of realize that we had a number of grades that didn't meet our, our target for the year, I, I think we should pause there for a little bit and, and kind of have a little bit more dialogue as to, you know, is there additional help or, or do we kind of feel that this is just kind of a stretch target and we're well equipped to kind of meet next, the next target down the, down the road? That's a great question. I, I, think, I think it is a stretch target. I think that's true. But having said that, I think the other thing that we are we're careful to do with map data is we, we do, you know, right now we're focused on spring 2019 data. And that is the way the KPI cuts it because that, that's, that's the way we've looked at it in the past. If you look between the baseline, which is two columns over from the shaded, and then the, the year one actual, so that again compares those percentiles for our, a given group of students. So, you know, we're seeing, you know, our second graders this year saw 5%, uh, uh, five, uh, you know, five, 5% higher achievement in that case. Many were consistent from year to year, and, and there, was, there was really you know, one slight dip, for, or two dips, both from some pretty high scores to begin with. So do we need, you know, does that mean we need to target specific support at grade levels? I think that's, that's where we look historically back at those reading scores and start to say, kind of like we, I, I discussed with math, are there some values that we are consistently seeing even within our own system? I think that I, I am going to tie it back to the implementation of a new curriculum, and I think that I think that the the, the answer to your question that I, that I would be, would give is yeah, we are well poised to continue to see growth in those areas. I really do believe that, you know, for for two thirds of our elementary teachers, this was the first year dealing with a, a new set of materials that asked them to to consider instruction in a pretty different way. And I think that when you talk to the people who were in their second year, their approach and their 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 confidence level is just is just different. And that's why we allow for some of that, you know, there's some of that time to see, often you see an implementation dip in scores, which is why I'm, I'm so, so tentative about saying we want to celebrate the new curriculum right away because th there could still be a little bit of, of, of implementation <coughs> slide as we move to that goal, which is why it's nice to have it as a, a, a three-year out target. So I think that the support we have, the, the, the English Language Arts Committee, who recommended the curriculum and has done a lot of work, continues to say, as we move into science implementation and math implementation, we have to remember that we're not done with ELA implementation. There's still work to be done, there's still support to be had. So a couple of those district Mondays that are coming up are going to have an ELA focus to make sure that we're continuing to support the implementation. So I don't think it's targeted support yet, I think it's district-wide broad support for that implementation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In the, um, on the slide about uh, meet and exceeds <coughs> growth target for math. Yes. When you follow the cohort down, like, um, for instance, eighth grade, the purple one, um, is the, even though the achievement percentile, like you said, achievement percentile compares to other districts, but so essentially we're doing well compared to other districts, but how, how does that sync with the fact that the growth is not the same over the year? They're not growing the same amount. So, do you understand what I mean? Like it's going down, so, what, this, so less people are meeting their target. Correct. So in, in, in this case, that, that is happening in some ways as we go down. One thing to consider is that the higher your map score gets, the smaller the number of points are between the targets. For example, if, you're achieve, if you start at a 252 or 253, the movement from a 253, you know, the, the range starts to compress. And so we have many of our seventh and eighth grade students who are achieving it at, at rather high levels, and then those targets are actually the, become more difficult to achieve. It's kind of that old anecdotal, it, it's much harder to get from an A to an A plus than it is to get from a C to an A, right? And so some of that, as we see our achievement percentiles growing, it, it does make growth more difficult to achieve. With that said, it certainly is something that we want to we want to take a look at. We also know that over the past few years, we've had some inconsistencies in the application of, of, of materials in our, you know, third, fourth, fifth grades for sure. And so we don't, we don't know exactly what that effect could be on our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders who have moved into a more consistent resource. But we, you know, the application of some of those early skills have been done by a, a couple of different methodologies and resources. And so that's something to consider too as we move forward. Do you ever look, um, just when you were talking about comparing uh, nationally to kids at the same grade level, et cetera, do you ever, um, are you ever able to see data or study um, are these dips like 
national trends that where you see you see that kind of stereotypically across the board for all eighth graders at a national level, et cetera, where it might help to explain some of the ebbs and flows of the data in our district? So the, the norming information really gives us, you know, it, it basically, it, it suggests that there shouldn't be. You know, it might be that the, the, the numbers don't grow in a, in a specific sequence. A 222 in one year might be a, a 50th percentile, and in the next year it might be a 75th, or in the next year it might be a, a 52nd, depending on how that all works. That's all the, the background math behind the norming. So um, in terms of achievement, we, there really isn't an expected dip. It really has to do with that consistent, you know, here's our national 50th percentile. In terms of growth, we haven't, we honestly, we, I will just say we haven't explored that to see if there, if there are ways to see where that looks. But because MAP is nationally normed at that 50th percentile, it really is saying that if you are at 50, that is a typical year of achievement or growth, or, you know, that's right in the middle. And so whenever we're below 50, that tells us that we're, we're doing a little bit less than what would be expected of us in a given year. Unfortunately, we aren't below that very often. <laughs> um, okay, the last thing I want to talk about tonight is um, looking forward at MAP administration. And when we when we think about all of the assessments that we, that we administer to our students and the way we use data and, and our approach to all of that, there have been a lot of conversations around the amount of assessment that happens in district. And some we don't have control over, some is mandated, some we do have a control over. And Ames Web and MAP and those are things that are locally chosen assessments so we can decide how we want to use those. And so through conversations with our differentiation and assessment committee and our, our administrative team and larger groups of teachers, we, we've, we've come to uh, an agreement that we're going to recommend not administering MAP district-wide in the fall, beginning next year. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, I'm going to click to the next slide and just kind of talk through some of these. Um, the first has to do with the instructional time. You know, this is the time when, we're, when we're, we're beginning to build classroom communities, when we're really starting to establish routines and things like that. And so to, to pause that in, in the first weeks of school for assessments that are multiple hours in length is something that if it was truly giving us information we couldn't get otherwise, I think we would want to continue. But the reality is that the, the data we get from our students' spring MAP scores ought to be, statistically speaking, as reliable, if not more so, than the fall scores. If you think about it, the spring assessment happens after the period of most instruction. It's right toward the, we, we really bring it as close to the end of the school year as we reasonably can. Whereas the fall assessment happens at the interval long furthest from instruction for the majority of our students and and often only a few days into a new routine and sequence when we really haven't begun to reactivate some of their background knowledge some of the the, 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 the processing that, that we ask of them on a regular basis throughout the school year and so relying instead on that spring data allows us to make instructional decisions in the spring before we're leaving for the school year some of that or for the summer excuse me some of that began this year and even more of it will be allowed to happen next spring with this change, which allows for those conversations about what kinds of supports to be put in place for students in the fall to be had by the people who know the student best and have just spent all of that time with the student, as opposed to a classroom teacher who would be looking at fall data after three or four weeks of knowing a student who should certainly have some initial ideas, but probably isn't ready to say, I, don't, I, I agree or disagree with what the data is telling me, whereas a student who's had a, a, a teacher who's had a student for 36 weeks is able to say, that doesn't seem like the student I know, or yes, that absolutely aligns with the student I know, and this is how we should support them. One of the concerns that came up was District 99 does you had been using our fall map data recently for high school placement, and so in conversations with them, they are now going to be looking at all of our seventh grade data points as well as taking the eighth grade winter data point as a as sort of a backup. So we're working with them again. They're they're not exactly they're still going to have to tweak a little bit how their systems work, but they're confident that this will not have an adverse impact on high school placement for our current for next year's eighth graders. Um, one of the differences we'll see is we will no longer measure. Uh, we won't have all of that fall to spring growth data that we just took a look at. However, I added one sentence that I realized was an omission that might have thrown a, a little concern for people. We will be able to measure from spring to spring. And so what that will mean is instead of looking at the fall to the spring target, MAP also sets a target based on your spring score to the, to the, the subsequent spring. And so when we want to be measuring growth data, that's the data that we will use beginning in the spring of 2020. Because uh, we have all of this data in the NWA system, we're actually going to be able to pull all of our previous year's growth data. So we'll have the same six or seven years of growth data to make those comparisons so that we can, can see what those trends look like. It will look a 
little different, and that's why we're, we're not going to start looking at that tonight. We're going to look at what we're familiar with tonight and spend some time over the course of next year looking at what that spring-to-spring -spring data will look like. So that really brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, going forward, we're going to, going to again do the comparative analysis with our IAR and, and MAP data as we have in the past couple of mm -hmm. years once that data becomes available. We know that we're continuing to work with the ELA curriculum implementation, um, particularly with the study sync implementation. There was a lot of work this year um, looking at some of, the, some of the guaranteed pieces of that implementation, which will be happening uh, next year. And again, recognizing this is, it seems like we've been talking about the ELA curriculum forever, but this truly is the end of year one of full implementation. And so that's, you know, we're on, we are only at that point in the journey, though we've made some significant strides. Um, I mentioned that eighth grade math growth data, which is something we do want to take uh, a further look into, as well as that subgroup data that I think is going to be actually exciting data for our principals to, to really dig into. Again, we haven't really broken it down like that before, so that's an exciting piece for us. Are there any other questions I can answer tonight? Justin, I had a question about, um, I think this is really a two-part question depending on your answer to the first part. Um, how much was kindergarten fall map used to assess where students are in the first time students are in school and teachers haven't, don't have historical data on those students? And if that was used to assess where students are when they were first coming into school, how do we help our kindergarten teachers know where students are when they're in kindergarten? So Carrie's here. She'll nod and back me up. When we ask the kindergarten teachers that question, what they really, what we've really acknowledged is that the kindergarten fall map test is much more of a trackpad assessment, how well you can use the technology, than it really is of, of, of skill. It's, it's so early in the year. We're just working on routines. Our kindergarten teachers really said that that is not data that they are using. They have a number of other, they do value certainly the Ames Web data because that's an individual one-on-one -on -one assessment. There are also a number of um, assessments that we have developed locally in terms of those foundational skills, particularly in reading, that are, are significantly valued. And so in, in this case, we're, we're definitely not taking away anything that the kindergarten teachers had been using. The, the one thing we have talked about is we want to make sure that the kindergarten students have exposure to the MAP platform prior to the winter assessment so that we don't just sort of delay that, that newness of, of the assessment. So they'll do some practice assessments and things like that leading up to the winter administration. What do, what do we use right now for kindergarten math assessment? I saw the literacy numbers, but what, what happens for math? So the, the, the math assessments are, we have a, there are a number of, of actually district created individual math assessments that are there that just tie back to the standards. The kindergarten math standards are written pretty explicitly and so being able to, you know, to, to, to sort numbers, to sort things in a field of, of, of five or to count to ten and to it all, row count all those kinds of things. So it really is, again, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, assessments. We have district created assessments that are available and there are other teachers who have used. We have a program called ESGI also that we purchased last year for all of our kindergarten teachers which helps, uh, has some pre-created assessment, helps teachers to also create their own and, and use a, a digital tracking system and that also aligns um, and, and con contains all of the mandatory kids assessment data, some of which are actually similar to assessment we would also do, others of which are, are not necessarily. And does MEP get to Member Olchek's question about what additional tools or resources do we need? Um, if we have a consistent district-wide Ames Web effort for literacy, mm -hmm. is there something similar either through that same organization or otherwise that makes sense for us to invest in district-wide for math, or is there a pedagogical reason that we just choose to do it uh, district uh, in district? No, we um, we are we are actually certainly in the process of trying to look for something that will do for math what Ames Web does for um, for reading and for literacy at sort of that that uh, screener level. The previous edition of Ames Web had a math component that we act, that we liked and had used. The new revision of Ames Web Plus, which we've now had for two years, um, we, we have not found the math assessment component to be as as friendly or as meaningful. And so we're actually in a we're, we are looking uh, use, utilizing our math intervention next year, our Title I interventionists, we're looking at a, a kind of a, a small-scale exploration of a couple of other tools that might provide that. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, it was, uh, um, there's a lot of really good positive uh, data in here. It, it's really nice to see some of the growth and it, that it's continuing. I, I, I really enjoyed that you said once again, and it's been said multiple times, that, that ELA doesn't stop here, that we're going to continue to educate. Uh, the teachers on it and how to use it. I know 
it is a very robust system, and I know that even uh, my own child, like we get a note from the teacher that's like, yeah, that one didn't go the way I had. We're gonna we're gonna retry that one again, and and so I think that that's very valuable to make sure that we're continuing to grow on there. Uh, the question I have regarding, um, I know we're not quite at math yet, but with that, where we tend to see some of our traditional dips, um, we obviously have a lot of that uh, micro data that's kind of telling us where we're off. Is that something that in that sort of evaluation process we're looking to see if maybe that is a better fit for, for some of those dips or is, are we just kind of looking at it more of a broad spectrum? So when the committee went back and looked at some of those, those that third, fourth, and fifth grade, you know, those, those valleys we had identified, yeah. uh, what they did was recognize that in our current blueprint at that time, certainly, there were some standards that simply weren't addressed or weren't addressed as fully as we might have hoped. And so at that point, their task was to try to find materials to address them. Mm -hmm. And essentially, they have... I believe they have researched and found all of the free or very inexpensive material that would be available to address those gaps. What we are looking for in the new resource is something that comprehensively addresses each of the standards sequentially at each grade level with the hopes that we can just follow that sequence and, and it will do all of that for us. There are always some gaps you will find in any resource to be sure, but I think that what we're hoping is that they will be minimal. And so that's, I think, how we'll address that. It won't be, do we need to really zero in on this particular standard in third grade? It really comes down to comprehensively, does each grade level material fully address the standards that are prescribed for us? Perfect. And then um, with that, I, I know you kind of addressed it a little bit, that with adoption of new curriculum, we can see some fluctuation in, in expectations. And we did set some pretty aggressive KPIs uh, coming out of this. Um, do we have any concern on where we put those numbers and the fact that we do have a lot of implementations coming out here? For, you know, several years in a row we're gonna be doing, implementing a lot of change. I just wanna make sure that, what, that when we're sitting up here and we're looking at those performance indicators that uh, the concern I have is if, if you begin to kind of go, all right, well, we are growing, we're not hitting those, but, but we're okay, that we begin to diminish the, the importance of those. And I, w I want to address the fact that we are going through a lot of change and we are also having a lot of growth. Um, and I just want to make sure we're not setting ourselves up to the point that KPIs don't mean a lot for us as a district, that we think that we, right. it, we might be stretching, but, but we are moving close you know, to those goals. I know that out of the strategic plan, we, and to kind of meet the new standards, we, we want to be really aggressive with this, and I appreciate that. I think we're also undertaking a lot, and I want to make sure that we really, that we get a lot, of, you get a lot of excitement from us and the board and the community by what we're accomplishing and making sure that we're setting ourselves up in, in a way. So I just wanted to kind of feel that out a little bit. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think we, you're right that we said from day one these were, these were ambitious targets. I think that, um, you know, what's happening concurrently with the new curriculum adoption and, and pilot and research in, in reading and math is that we're also researching and, and learning about and, and providing professional learning on best practice in math and reading and writing and grammar instruction. And I think that that's, that's the reason that I am not concerned that we're going to continue to see growth because I really do think that what we are providing for our teachers with the early release Mondays, with the addition of curriculum coordinators who can continue to support some of those pieces. You know, we're, we're, when, we, when we talked even about the implementation cycle, if you recall, the curriculum council and some other groups said, we can only do this and believe we could possibly do it well if we're supporting it with some of these other components. And so I think the, the resource, the, you know, the, the investment in resources, the, the research behind what really drives quality instruction and making sure that we are not only telling our teachers about it, but, but supporting them in, in, an, in an embedded way in the classroom so that they can really have the room to explore some of those newer strategies and, and feel good about it, along with materials that support those kinds of strategies. I, I think in a lot of ways the sky's the limit. I think, I think you know, I, I really, I, I agree. I don't want to be standing here in two years trying to justify less growth on the KPIs. I think we are absolutely intending to and expecting to see these numbers to continue to, to grow. It may it will be, you know, each grade level could be a little different as we as we've noticed. But I think that we're I think that we're in a really exciting position for, for what our students can continue to achieve. See when I when I hear that commentary, I'm I'm excited as well, but I think, you know, if I'm somebody in the community that kind of just put, picks this slide deck 
off the website, you know, two weeks from now without hearing that commentary, I am concerned. So I, I think we should kind of figure out, is there a better way which we could kind of present that, that commentary so we as a community kind of feel better about those KPIs and our high confidence level and kind of meeting that, that next um, set of milestones that we set forth. I, yeah, and I appreciate that. We're, as we're as as Megan's working on the annual report to the community, we're, we're looking closely at which pieces of data we want to include there, and, and what can can balance the need to tell that story and our confidence in a succinct and accurate and, and realistic manner. So, yeah. Well, thank you for your hard work. Presentation was great. Appreciate Thanks. it. All right, with that, we have listed on tonight's agenda. There are two communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? All right. Then we'll move on to the reports to the board. And uh, first of all, welcome Dr. Russell to, to the dais tonight. We appreciate you being here. And um, looking forward to your first superintendent report. Well, thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the audience, and uh, I'm happy to report that it's great to be back home in District 58. So I can't thank the Board of Education, uh, both the previous board and this board, enough for the warm welcome and all the, the guidance, especially Board President Hughes. I know you and I have been working extremely closely. And then Melissa, uh, the last few days, uh, Melissa, the, the assistant at um, our, our Administrative Service Center, has just been unbelievable to me and, and so welcoming. And, and thank you for putting up with my gazillion questions over the last few days. I, I certainly appreciate that. Um, I've completed phase one of the, my transition plan. And what that looked like was you know, trying to soak in as many documents as possible, try to meet with as many stakeholder groups as possible. And now that July 1 has passed, we, we now begin phase two. And, and what phase two looks like is really diving into that strategic plan, continuing to meet with all stakeholders from the Board of Education to our staff, um, to uh, administrators, community members, and to really start to prioritize those items in the strategic plan so what our community put forth on paper can become a reality over the next several years. And so that's the main focus between um, now and winter break, and then phase three would be you know, really um, fine tuning a lot of that work. So again, I am just thrilled to be back home in Downers Grove 58, and I just can't thank the community enough for the warm welcome uh, that I've received. We are very busy over the summer. My, my children always joke with me, well, Dad, what do you do over the summer? Um, summertime is actually very busy for uh, the administrative team. Uh, just this morning, we had our administrative uh, retreat for uh, our teaching and learning component of the Administrative Service Center. Uh, we had a very good morning. I, I want to thank the team. Uh, in late July and early August, we'll bring the entire administrative team together and have an even bigger retreat. And during those retreats, we're not only planning for the upcoming school year, but we're growing as professionals. We're talking about our goals. So the questions that we received around assessment are, are some of the same questions that we ask ourselves during those retreats to talk about, are these realistic learning targets? Uh, what can we do as, as fellow educators to meet these targets? So we'll continue to dialogue uh, with that. In addition, I'm, I'm happy to report that our new science materials are all in. Uh, Justin and James and the rest of the team over at Longfellow are working very hard. The goal is for our teaching staff to have these ready to go in their classrooms on day one so our kids can start that learning from the, from the very moment that they begin. And I'm pleased to report that uh, Justin is very confident that that will happen. In addition, with our technology and our, our student devices, I've also met with James and uh, that is also the goal of our technology department and they're well uh, on their way to make sure that all of our student machines and all of our staff machines in the network is ready to go so learning can start taking place on day one, which is a former teacher. Uh, that's something I know that all of our teachers and our support staff appreciate when everything is ready to go on day one. So I want to thank the team over at uh, Longfellow for all of their hard work, and uh, I know we'll be able to meet those targets. In addition to that, uh, revenue sources are always a, a very big thing, especially in our school district, given, uh, you know, it, we'll have a presentation on the tentative budget. Uh, Justin and, and many other central office administrators are working hard on all of our grants. That would include our Title I or Title II, Title III, uh, Title IV, uh, trying to get those in line so that we can uh, take advantage of that revenue. Um, even though it's not a big piece of our overall budget, every dollar counts, and to make sure that we have those in place as well to uh, get going on the school year. 
And then finally, um, Jane and the personnel uh, team are, are making sure that all of our uh, new hires are up to speed and, and ready to go. And uh, she's doing a, a wonderful job with that. And uh, so we're just excited for the upcoming school year. And again, I can't thank everyone enough for the warm welcome. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or just want to discuss the district. Uh, my door is always open, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Kevin. All right, next we're on to the monthly business and the treasurer's report with Todd Drayfall. I'm working on the paperless part. <laughs> Uh, so in this month's packet, you have the May uh, year-to-date report. Uh, we talked about that last month that we were uh, given the balancing time. Um, you would be getting that a month late. Uh, again, uh, due to closing dates and, and the holiday and the board meeting time, uh, we don't have your end of June or your end of year report uh, cash basis. We are very close to that and we'll have that out. And actually, we couldn't send that to the board um, shortly and, and then post it. Um, I will tell you just verbally that we you know, will end the year uh, in a positive note with um, revenue over expenses for fiscal year 19, uh, which is where we had projected and planned. Uh, so that's good news. Um, we have a cash basis, which is we'll have one number. We have an accrual basis that will come with the audit, which will be a different piece. Um, in fact, that will be a little bit larger uh, due to some early tax money that was received in 18 that will be booked for 19. So when you get the cash number, know that it will uh, rise from that point. So, um, so that's what you have in your report um, for this month uh, and what, what you uh, don't have but we'll see shortly. Um, you also then have the June 30th bill list. So anything that is um, lagging behind that <coughs> June meeting, we put in there for your approval uh, for, to, you know, so we have that. So it lists on uh, last year's budget and then, of course, a much smaller list for, uh, for this year that starts the new fiscal year. Um, you have in your packet, uh, again, uh, sort of calendar issues. Um, we need to have a 30-day window between the time we present a budget to be put on display for you to approve it to be on display and uh, when the board has a budget hearing and approval. Uh, we don't have those 30 days between your normal August and September board meetings. So you have a early tentative display budget uh, for your approval to put on display tonight. Uh, it is also balanced, although I will tell you on a 70 some odd million dollar, $78 million budget, it's $3,000 to the good, uh, which is zero. Um, it is an early projection. We are still working through things. We don't know. There are some unknowns on that, particularly on the revenue side. Uh, we, are, we project uh, a little bit of what we think we'll get in, in state or the current numbers, uh, particularly for the evidence-based funding. We have the current... Uh, year plus a percent in there. Uh, we don't know what that number will be. Uh, transportation and so forth, we are working on those claims now and we'll get those into the state uh, and then we will know what that funding format is uh, as well as corporate personal property replacement tax, which is about an $800,000 plus uh, revenue stream. So all of those things, we have some unknowns. Um, given what we have seen in the last fiscal year, uh, we believe that we'll see increases in those, but not having that information, we don't want to project ahead of time um, with this piece. So, um, so you're close to zero. Uh, we hope that uh, when we come back to you know uh, the budget meeting uh, that we have in August, and then obviously the final piece in, in September uh, will be in a different light that will have additional revenues to help offset. Um, and we'll also have a better time, a better chance now to go through and find to find, find comb, you know, through those other areas and see where we may have some over budgets of, of, of areas that we don't need to increase or can adjust. So, and probably we're going to have some that are going to go up as well. Um, so that is uh, what we have for the business report uh, for this month. Any questions? 
Well, obviously, we'd really like to see the a little bit more of a surplus going in there than three thousand dollars. Because you're right, that is zero, and, <laughs> and 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 it is getting it gets tight every year, you know, and um, in, in making that so those, fi and those final payrolls and. and yes, yeah, so we've pointed out there are some. I mean, there are some pieces that we looked at and worked to and and have added into this into the FY20 budget. So there's added personnel in there to help cover some needs that have been discussed and reviewed and, and, and talked about for the last fiscal year uh, in, in you know, nursing areas and, and right. psycholo you know, psychology um, and so forth you know, to, to meet needs. And we tried to cover as we're able to, but we're at the end of our, our piece for that until we have a really better idea of our, our total revenue stream. You no, know, I, know, I know you keep it running pretty lean, and, and we appreciate that. But yeah, it, uh, we are going to have to continue, I think, to get more creative over time. And uh, I don't know that all the final numbers aren't in yet, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Under our committees, the policy committee did not meet in June, nor did the legislative committee, the financial advisory committee, or the district leadership team. So next up is the discuss. What? Next up is the discussion on the Facility Planning Council update, which will be started once again by Todd Drayfall. And Brad from uh, Whiting Company is going to join me too. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> So the board has had a few reports over the last year from the Facility Planning Council. Um, this is kind of a big point where we've been uh, 10 months of work uh, where we're going to show some initial estimate numbers um, of where we are at with all of that uh, process that has gone on through all of the uh, input of staff and, and community. Uh, and review of facilities. Um, so we'll start out with our, our timeline. When we have it listed as previous timeline because we think we're going to need to make some adjustments. And you know, we set this timeline together last September. Yeah. We've stuck to it fairly pretty well up until now when we think there, you know, we, we want to look at and depending on as we go through this process how to proceed going forward as far as input uh, from the community um, but as we went through you have where you know that we've taken in some input and gone through evaluated uh, facilities uh, done you know updated demographic studies looked through all the you know the old facility reports uh, presented to the board a couple of times the uh, the guiding principles and some of the foundation areas that we focused on and which has brought us into uh, the areas that uh, we're going to talk about of, of, of focus of oversight of well, I'm just going to kind of move on because I will there we go the, the core guiding principles uh, and the concepts and the, uh, and the initial processes that we've developed uh, some of this it base comes back from the strategic plan that was approved by the board uh, last spring so out of that strategic plan that, that came out of the community of the last year's work, there were three councils set up with three goals, um, connecting to the community, focusing on learning, and securing the future. And the facility planning council was what came out of the securing the future piece and has gone through this process that we've talked about with the timeline. Out of that was the objective in developing and focusing a long-term facilities improvement plan to ensure safe, modern, and effective learning environments for all students and, can, and considers the following safety, security, air conditioning, six, eight grade middle schools, uh, class size and enrollment projections, and district facility use. And I know the board last month saw or had a presentation from the Instructional Model Review Council, I got it right, right? Uh, that Justin uh, facilitated with that evaluation on the potential of moving from 6 8 model. So that is part of what you will see coming forward as what that would look like and what our facilities need to support that model. Again, 
we're always looking at what our facilities need to do to support our instruction and curriculum. So modernizing an effective learning environment, safe security, air conditioning, 6 8 middle schools, class size. These are all out of the strategic plan uh, that was adopted in spring of 18. And that has been what our focus and our, our structure has been looking at for the last 10 months. So that in turn with Brad. So before Brad gets going, one of the things that we had asked our architectural firm to really do is say, let's review the main components of the strategic plan and come up with an inclusive presentation that encompasses everything that people discussed at the strategic plan. It certainly won't um, involve every option that's available out there, but, but certainly the, the intent of this presentation is to say, if everything that we discuss in the st strategic plan becomes a reality, this is what it possibly um, could look like. And then Brad will walk us through at the end of this, kind of the next steps where we go from there. So Brad, yeah. thank you for all your hard work uh, on this presentation. Well, thank you, I'm very happy to be here. Usually we see Amy Tiberi, uh, who's not <laughs> able to make it tonight. I'm filling in for her. Um, a little bit of background on me, as Senior Vice President of White & Company. I lead our K-12 through education market, so I'm pretty much involved in all of our school clients uh, that we get involved in, and heavily involved in all the <clears throat> upfront early master planning community engagement type work. I've been to many of the meetings that Amy's been to, not all of them, but I have a pretty good handle on all the, the conversations over the past year with uh, the school district and the community. So uh, to kind of set this up, I think it's important to establish a really good foundational understanding of what creates a facility master plan. And I like this little analogy of the dominoes because it provides a good core understanding. If you think about dominoes that are stacked up like this in a row, there are certain items that can be pulled off, done individually, that don't have another impact on other school districts or other schools. For example, uh, creating safe and secure atmospheres, secure entrances can be done individually at a school. Addressing indoor air quality, air conditioning issues at an individual school doesn't impact other schools. Same thing happens when you, for example, modernize a library or create collaborative learning environments. Those are all individual things, the maintenance issues and the needs at the individual buildings are all individual. But if you think about a full long range master plan, there's other issues that if you push the dominoes, there's gonna be an impact on other areas across the district. For example, for your district, you know, creating a, moving to a sixth through eighth grade middle school model through grade configuration creates an opportunity at the elementary schools as you free up space to enhance 21st century learning, provide other improvements that programmatic improvements that may be, may be critical at that in each individual school. Looking at the, uh, the district facility use in terms of Longfellow and the ASC provides an opportunity, a way to maximize uh, taxpayer resources to be a little bit more efficient, uh, more efficient in how you provide services to the district and to the school. So that's a little bit of a foundational understanding how we look at a very complex problem, a, a challenge about creating a, a facility master plan. If we step all the way back, um, you know, through the whole uh, fall and into the spring, the whole uh, the series of meetings with the Facility Planning Council, uh, all the individual meetings and conversations with the schools, the community engagement meetings, those really kind of filtered out three core guiding principles that we've talked about in the past, this time presented a little bit differently. So the things that we heard that have been essentially guiding the development of a facility, facility master plan is that people need safe and healthy environments to, to maximize student achievement, to provide a, a good atmosphere for uh, teachers to work in and really work with students. So things like safe and secure atmospheres, uh, spaces that enhance uh, the health and well-being of students, uh, spaces that are comfortable and for learning and working, and then the whole notion of improved air, indoor air quality, uh, air conditioning, et cetera. Those are all critical elements of creating those kind of environments. We also know that learning is enhanced when school spaces are designed to support the type of instruction that students need going forward. And so when you talk about spaces that are inspirational, that have a lot of daylight, that has been, research has proven that daylight and views have a benefit in student achievement, uh, the right types of furniture and flexibility of spaces to allow a dynamic uh, learning space, and then providing 
kind of those uh, secondary spaces for collaboration between students, for creativity, um, those kind of environments are critical. And then third, the other th major core guiding principle or theme was that, that students are benefited when they're more connected. They're more connected to their peers, they're more connected to teachers, uh, they're connected to an adult and that has proven the ability to enhance the comfort of students and the learning uh, possibilities for students as well. So how support spaces are organized, how they're connected to each other, where they're located, uh, the types of spaces that support social and emotional learning, support those uh, well-being of students. Those are all the three really core guiding principles that we heard from, from the community and from the facility planning council and the teachers. So given that, our challenge is to then take those three core guiding principles, bring in all the uh, assessments that we've done in terms of the looking at how the, well the buildings support 21st century teaching and learning, the work of uh, Kevin and his team to look at the needs of the building from a maintenance standpoint, and blend all those together into a facility master plan. So that's what we've tried to do. Um, now, when you think about how that's gonna come out uh, in the conversation through the course of the rest of this year, how that's gonna be presented in August, you're gonna see a lot of numbers, you're gonna see a lot of priorities, you're gonna wanna share that information with the community. So what we wanted to do is try to kind of categorize the work into buckets, because I think that's gonna help the conversation, help people understand um, where the dollars are, where the needs are, how things are interconnected. So we've kind of created four buckets, but the three core buckets are the maintenance issues, the safe and healthy environments issues, and then the 21st century learning issues. So maintenance is kind of the physical needs of the buildings, the, the capital improvements, the mechanical, electrical, the interior repairs, the site improvements, kind of the physical infrastructure of each individual school. Safe and healthy environments go to uh, issues like secure entrances, uh, go to the indoor air quality and the air conditioning in the individual buildings. 21st century learning is the, the types of spaces that support what students need as, they, as we try to prepare them, as you try to prepare them for, for not only uh, high school when they go to District 99, but also the types of careers they're gonna go into. That particular one is a little bit harder sometimes for communities to understand because that's not the type of schools that a lot of community members have been through. So what does it look like? What does a 21st century learning space look like? So these are just some kind of pictorial examples that you have seen before that kind of shed a light on when we think about and talk about what 21st century spaces are, here's what we're talking about. So it starts in the classroom. So classrooms that are very dynamic, that are different color, they, they, they enable different types of learning environments. The furniture is key to that, that it can adjust to create large group instruction, it can create small group instruction uh, very dynamically from period to period or even within the same, within the same class. <clears throat> Secondly is all those spaces that I mentioned outside of the classroom, these collaboration spaces in hallways, uh, down at the end of, a, of, a, of, a, of an opportunity or a, at the end of a hallway, kind of fit between two individual spaces. Spaces where kids can break out, have reading instruction, uh, work with, a, work with a, a teacher, they can work together on a little project, they can do some work digitally, just a, an opportunity to get outside of the traditional classroom. A 21st century school, learning happens everywhere, not just in the, in the box of a, of a traditional classroom. Um, but we know that as we think about what the needs are, STEM and maker spaces are, are pretty much uh, becoming standard in, in educational spaces. That's where students can apply the different types of curriculum. Uh, they can make things, they can you know, find, the, find the opportunities to do things over when it doesn't go right the first time. It's a very collaborative, technology-based of, type of space that is not typically found in a, in a 20th century school. So a lot, of, a lot of these spaces are adjacent to libraries. Uh, they're critical at the middle school level. Another key element that I mentioned a little bit earlier is daylight. Now, in some, a lot of these spaces, especially when you have collaborative spaces like this where students get outside of the classroom, you wanna have daylight. You wanna have views into the other spaces. It creates a, an overall atmosphere for learning which is uh, supportive, collaborative, and, 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 and quite honestly, more, more healthy. So uh, those are the three main ingredients, but then when you think about some of the issues that came out of, or the challenges that came out of the strategic planning group, um, the 
fourth and final one is really the whole notion of great reconfiguration. And, and you, do you want to, and, and the best way to um, convert your existing middle schools from a 7-8 seven, seven, model to a 6-7-8 model? And with that comes all kinds of 21st century learning opportunities. So Herrick and O'Neill kind of stand, uh, they're, they're those dominoes that you push over, that there's an impact and an opportunity across the entire district if you were able to do that. So um, you've seen this series of slides before in terms of the two solutions for Herrick. Just to recap those quite uh, a little bit quickly. Um, what we wanted to do was look at the two individual buildings to see how, kind of do a test fit, how would we, what would we need to do to the buildings to expand them, to create uh, space for a sixth grade, how would it fit, what's the potential initial budget estimate for doing that work. And so uh, what you saw the last time on the first floor, what we call concept one for Herrick would be a larger addition on the front of the school to, to address a lot of the issues that would be needed. It's just not adding classrooms because you're gonna have an extra grade level in there. You have to create other adjacent spaces uh, support spaces that would have a, a kind of a ripple effect within their own individual building. So this concept has a new main entrance, uh, an expanded gym, auxiliary gym, an additional two-story classroom addition on the, I guess that's the south southwest corner. Uh, now looking at that individual building, there's some initial estimates for those on the maintenance side, the safety, safe and healthy environments side, as well as the grade reconfiguration side. So those three buckets if I think, or if we think comprehensively about what a modernized middle school would be with dollars that would be not just projected in today's dollars, but also projected out uh, probably three, four, five years, depending on when design and construction could happen, that initial concept for here would be initial estimate about 57, 58 million dollars. Okay. Now, another concept that we looked at at Herrick, if you recall, there were two concepts there. We looked at a smaller addition on the front of the school. This overall solution is substantially less square footage, so it's the, the, the square foot per student is also less, but we think this could work very well. A couple big, bigger additions on the kind of the south southeast corner of the building for a two classroom addition as well as an auxiliary gymnasium. With this comes also the maintenance work that would be required at those buildings the safe and healthy environments, the secured entrances, the air conditioning, again, a completely modernized middle school for the 21st century. That initial estimate would be around $51 million. So you see, again, uh, escalated out several years for when work could actually be, be, be completed. So um, you see two estimates there for Herrick, uh, both kind of within, the, within that same time frame. Uh, uh, cost range, cost estimate range. So these are just estimates. There's a lot of work to be done, a lot of details to be figured out. We really haven't even started designing yet. It's just kind of a test fit scenario based on some initial square footage that we see today projected out for a long period of time. Any questions on here? Okay, similar process for O'Neill. Uh, if you recall, we just did one concept for O'Neill because it presents a little bit more uh, simple challenge compared to Eric. So uh, same, same uh, addition at the front of the school to surprise some of that support, uh, student support spaces, secured entrances, an opportunity to maybe rethink how the library is, is configured and located within the building, classroom additions over on the east side, as well as some expanded support spaces for cafeteria kitchen over on the on the south end again it covers all those three same buckets that we saw the last time comprehensively <clears throat> initial budget estimate for O'Neill about 45 45 and a half million dollars again escalated out a few years it's important when you get into conversations with your community which there's lots of time to do that these numbers are not in today's dollars these are out two three four five years because we don't know exactly when it's going to happen so we've been very conservative with these numbers for you Okay, so we've also gone through a similar process with the elementary schools, looking at those three kind of buckets, so to speak, with those fun little characters that, that lay out the maintenance needs. Again, um, the maintenance, the safe and healthy environments, this, these are for all the elementary schools combined, the 21st century learning opportunities. The maintenance uh, plan is really looking at a 10-year forecast for all the uh, maintenance needs of the building. So that number up there would take you a long way towards and maintaining the physical infrastructure of your buildings simultaneously. So when we talk about a 
facility master plan, a long range facility master plan, this is long range. This is not just a, an initial <clears throat> get something done solution. Um, kind of going, putting all of those numbers together, and this is I think what everybody's been waiting for. So if you look at the bottom of those, the, cap, the maintenance needs, the safe and healthy environments, the 21st century learning. Now, those first two items, when you, when you think about the numbers that I presented earlier for Herrick and O'Neill, some of the maintenance items, dollars in, in those line items, or the, in the column, the safe and healthy environments, some of those dollars are within the overall Herrick solution and the O'Neill solution. And then the, the impact on the right for the grade reconfiguration specifically at Herrick and O'Neill's about 54, 50, 55 million dollars. Combine all of that initial look at order of magnitude, thinking about a 10 year program, thinking about when work would get done, very conservative at this stage of the game, right around 245 million dollars. Not what we would, it's what we would expect for a district of your size uh, with you know, 13 buildings, the age of the buildings, kind of the, the, the work that's been done in the past the opportunities that are ahead. So that's kind of how we would look at um, overall, think about these things. We've also um, have some additional information by elementary school. We talk about how those numbers break out. Lots of details for this information, way too much to dig into in a board meeting, but all that information is available by school. And then uh, Todd's gonna talk a little bit about what the steps are going forward. And then I'm gonna close and set things up. I think it's important to point out, though, on the maintenance pieces, given the age of some of the buildings and some of the needs on the electrical and so forth, that that's the reason that that number is, is up there as it is, because there is a fair amount of, of, of roof work and, and re, you know, that needs to be done, again, over the next 10 years is the 10-year window, um, but also electrical and plumbing and so forth that you know, we have uh, to address, uh, given given the age of some of those. So on a proposed uh, time frame, so what we would like to do is, is make some adjustments um, given this process and then in looking at and going back out to the community and starting to work and evaluate uh, and this process and what is important now that we have numbers to these things and you know to re-engage the community into a process to develop this because obviously when we're everyone is putting through on little bullet points and things ideas and what they want to see and stuff and that's what we wanted to do is focus and, and get a baseline foundation now that we have that estimate it's time to go back and talk to those you know again in a different format sure so next step um, We'll, we'll follow up, I'm sure we're gonna have lots of discussion tonight. Follow up on that discussion, bring back for your August meeting uh, a draft of the facility master plan, which will have a lot of these details. Uh, prepare, <laughs> prepare for additional community feedback, and then go through a, a process of evaluating options and alternatives uh, for what the FPC is. is. The FPC gonna continue? Is there gonna be another stakeholder group that'll be as part of that process? Um, and then the, the challenges or the opportunity is really is how do you take this back out to the community? So we've kind of, as the prior slide showed, we've kind of looked at about a three month window of time uh, where you know, everybody's back focused on kids are back in school, teachers are in school. So it's really the prime, prime time, spoke, so to speak, to have more events with the community, whether that's open houses, go to back to school events, uh, share this information on social media, media channels, any other way that you can get this information out so that you can get feedback from the community. There's also an, uh, an opportunity, we see a lot of school districts that uh, engage a third party consultant to share this information. Um, you know, all, the whole conversation about you know, the grade reconfiguration of the 6-8 middle school, critical. Uh, there's opportunities to, to get feedback and survey feedback in different ways, whether it's phone survey, mail survey, uh, internet survey to help the community be engaged and develop what some of the priorities are, if the thinking has changed. And then evaluate the options. So there's the whole option of timing, there's the action, option of you know, the scope of each individual building, there's the option of how you, the thing you need to look at in terms of funding, the impact of the 
parent Illinois capital bill and how that's going to be all shaken out and then just kind of the continuous uh, conversation uh, at the board level with you know all these things that we've just put in front of you tonight and we'll continue in August I'm going to take one side note to the capital bill piece because I was able to, to talk to some people about what uh, there's been three billion dollars put aside for or 1.5 I think with matching from uh, school districts in the capital bill um, for school districts for capital construction um, supposedly there's a task force of legislators that will meet between sometime now through March to determine how that uh, funding will be um, reviewed so we previously there was a list with the state board that's been down there for 12 years uh, without funding um, there's been new lists submitted uh, so I don't think it's determined yet as to how that process um, and what that will be like but obviously there's some opportunity there that could have some additional funding source that is not specific to uh, local um, uh, resources uh, additionally um, as part of the budget we were able to receive uh, as we understand it uh, one you know over a million 1.7 million dollars uh, in money for playground updates, uh, which, by the way, is part of that 240 some odd million dollars, uh, because those areas were noted as needing to be updated, and so they are on those lists. Um, so when that comes to fruition, then those pieces will, you know, and we know more about that process, uh, that will assist in that. So there's resources out there, and we need to continually work for them. It's not all of it, and, you know, but there are some other areas that we need to, to work on to you know, find non-local re resources for. So that is where we're at. Questions, discussion? I'm sure we're going to have something, right? Um, I just kind of a reminder to everybody, too, and, and for people that um, weren't sitting on the board when we went through the strategic plan. Uh, our, our process was we did really engage with, with the community and we took an opportunity to really sort of say what is it that we really want to see in these schools in an overall big picture. You know, where are your priorities? And that came without dollars. You know, at that point it was really what, what in general is important to you. Now we're at that second phase where we listen to them. Uh, we took the opportunity to have um, Todd and his team, with the help of White and Company, develop what that would actually take to implement. So I think they alluded to it. Our, our next step really here is to um, engage back with the community and say, we heard you, and this is now what's coming back from that evaluation. This is the costs that come around it. And, and take an opportunity to really reevaluate um, priorities at this point, because priorities sometimes shift and change. When, when things have costs. So um, I just wanted to note that as we begin, um, you know, conversation to kind of just remind where we are um, in this phase of the project. So with that, discussion. I was, I was wondering on the slide about um, for the August board meeting, mm -hmm. present draft facility master plan. What does that, what does that mean? Like, okay, it's July. So at the next board meeting, what's gonna happen? So we're gonna, the plan would be to provide a document which is um, a lot more details than fits into a PowerPoint presentation. It has a lot of the background information that led up to the development of these plans, details on the elementary schools, um, which would have been really a lot to show here tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be a, a different type of document that has its draft in nature that would serve as the basis for further engagement with the community to look at and share details. and Like flushing out, like at this school the, these yeah, things would right. be you would, you would see a lot more information like a there. line item of are yes, there we, we could do that are there also dates attached to those like how old is the roof on Fairmount I know the tiles in the bathroom in the kindergarten room are from 1975 because they are the exact same tiles that I used when I was in kindergarten in 1975 so there are things that people need to realize that are extremely some, our buildings are extremely old, and I don't think 
unless your child's in there or unless you have gone to through the schools here that you understand the extent of aging. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the smells are exactly the same from 1975. <laughs> so air quality is also important, but I would love to see just th those dates attached to things so that people are starting to realize, oh my gosh, that, that roof is older than all of my kids and my grandchildren. I, being able to put it into a something that's not just, oh, let's do this instead of this. There is some of that we have in the facilities um, documents, that, and those are on the FPC um, uh, website, uh, on the Downshow the website, that I think we have a little packet of in there. That's probably 300 pages right. that has that detail piece. Okay. Um, and that was something that was done in 2012. Right. And so we you know, carried that information forward. Um, so yes, I mean, we have some of that, you know, we can get it down to the nitty gritty like that report is. Um, but yeah, it, it, we do have, I think. If that might be an amendment to <laughs> an exhibit. Well, and I also, um, when Ken provided a, a, within the last two years, just things like there's certain electric electric right. stuff or so or things right. that they don't even make those things anymore, and so it's impossible to provide or to get things to replace broken parts because that's how old these things are. In some, in, in some slides that we have like this, which are easier to look at, perhaps, right? You know, it does have you know, the additions. The original build date for O'Neill was 1957. Additions in 63, 67. So, you know, so you have those pieces up there as well to kind of give people the age of age. And we would have a slide for each school that would have that to help facilitate that visual. <laughs> well, and while we might not be at the stage yet, I think one of the things uh, we're hearing here is that there are, kind of to go back to your domino effect, there are things that have to be done for other things to be done. Those electrical systems have to be upgraded if we ever want to talk about air conditioning. That is not a component that can be pulled out. It's too critical to the way that the buildings work. You know, some of our plumbing system at some point have to be upgraded. They've been something that we've talked about um, for a long time in this community. And since I've been on the board, it's been something that I've heard every year when we talk about those critical numbers over the next 20 years, how many, how many projects we have to do capital-wise for our buildings just to, to be able to continue to function. Um, credit to our maintenance teams here for working magic for, for decades, you know, to keep some of these things existing much longer than I think that they were ever intended uh, to, to, to be in, um, be functioning, but uh, I mean that's that's fantastic. But at a certain point, that is going to have to be something that we look at. And those dependencies, I don't know that we're necessarily there yet. But as we go out and we have to really engage with the community on why, um, you know, if we need to try to collect some dollars, that's going to be a, a big component of it. Where where those dependencies lie. But continue. Uh, my greatest desire going forward is is to really um, have a very clear vision on, on how we're going to engage with the community. Uh, and since I've been on the board, we have gone out and talked to our constituents around the superintendent search and around the creation of our strategic plan. But we always have to be thinking about the fact that 70% of families in our district don't really care about those things. I mean, they care, but they don't, but they're not engaged actively because they don't send kids here. It's only about 30% of our families that do. So when we're engaging with families, if we just have an open house, you're going to draw from that 30% pool. But the people who are going to make the decision are going to fall on that 70% and the 30%. So, and obviously with the 70% being bigger, we definitely need to, um, I think, you know, we talk about a third party consultant. The, um, the, I think that, that is worth it for us to invest there because when, with the 99 referendum, I remember filling out a survey. I remember them taking the time to, to reach out to me, even though I don't have children going to 99 currently. I will in the future, but I mean, the entire, um, community was was given the opportunity to be engaged and with, if you just do a couple things on social media if you just have a couple open houses come some surveys going out to, to people who have email addresses register with the district you're not catching everybody and you're certainly not um, connecting with everybody who are going to swing the vote so um, I'd like to make sure that we are uh, reaching out in a very broad way to everybody who is going to have skin in the game, which is everybody. 
kind of piggybacking a little bit off of that, I think, um, in terms of how we're um, communicating or sharing information about the plan, and this is kind of even looking even further down the road after we've collected more feedback and gotten more information from all the various stakeholders, um, the idea that we are not 13 individual schools, but we're one district, and that, you know, the idea that kind of a rising tide is going to lift all boats, and that fair doesn't necessarily mean equal, everyone's not going to get the same, we need to be kind of casting the message that as we improve one building here or one building here, we're all improving together as a district, and I think that's a really important message to put out there, not only for people who might feel like, oh, I'm not getting as much as someone else, or even if they don't have any people, any students in the district at all, that as the district improves, the community improves, and that means your property value improves, right. and all that kind of stuff. It's such a domino effect, and I think that's a really going to be a really important part of the messaging, so to speak, of how we're going to bring this and, and present it to the community. So that's something that I think is really important. That's a great point, and, and the, our message has always been we strive for equity. Mm -hmm. um, that's the most important thing for us because um, that's that's what our, our children deserve. The other thing I just wanted to throw out there um, that I was thinking of was $244 million. I'm going to assume to most people that's, that, that's monopoly money. You know, they don't, they don't really um, understand the impact on their household budget. So I think we should be very um, transparent on what that means to uh, the, the median household owner in, in Downers Grove. At what point can we engage that third party consultant? Is that well, something like? I think that's one of the things we want to give. Can we do that tonight? We, right. Well, we, well, what we'll do is, that, I think. <laughs> I, I think the earliest we could like have a contract for you to approve would be August. At right. Your August board meeting. I, I think one of the things we're looking for tonight is consensus with the group to potentially go out and try to engage right. that, get a timeline and a plan together and a, and a contract so that we can go ahead and approve that. Um, in August, if that's something that this board is interested in doing and, and has agreement on that, then we can we can uh, set Kevin forward and in, in, in going ahead and securing that. I believe very strongly in that because they, uh, I know District 99, and I worked on the District 99 um, as a just a community member, um, and we they had a firm that they used that was fantastic, and they were integral in the success, in my opinion, having hiring an outside consultant to to make make it happen. So I, I think that's worth something that board should seriously consider. I concur. Yep. I thought 99 did a really good job with the way that they presented their plan, and I thought getting the community support was huge, and I think that probably was played a big factor. So I did. And that really is a definitive thing in what we need to do next. Like we said, you know, following up after we, we did the strategic plan, we got this information information initially now we've got this first kind of draft on on what this actually means and, and the costs that are associated with it so I think um, a solid engagement of not only our, our current um, students families but the entire community at large all, all of anybody who lives within the, the boundaries of, of 58 really needs to be engaged so that feedback is that we we're looking for for the next couple months here is to ask what what is most important to you we went out and we put a dollar amount on all these things so now what of the what is like absolutely what you are I think to, to me first round would be yeah like when you're when you're engaging with people is like we listen to you here's what we have and now here's what that means um, plan wise uh, here's the cost that would be associated here's the impact this is what a what a middle school that has six through eight physically looks like here's some options around in Ha let, let people consume the content that we just consumed and have actual discussions about that, fill out surveys, um, be active in that. And, and but, uh, on, on, the, on the presentation also, as a side note, and as somebody that sat in the audience for a lot of years, uh, Longfellow's been a topic and it was just casually mentioned here. <clears throat> no, it's still there and it's still being worked on, but it, it's still there. <laughs> and here. it's not going away, and we're still going to work towards coming to a conclusion on that process. Um, you mean evaluating? The evaluating and moving forward with a central, with, you know, with a plan to centralize and streamline um, the central core facilities and. 
to find use, you know, what would be the highest and best use for that, that facility, which we don't believe to be district property. Is that evaluation going on simultaneously in parallel to the community engagement of all other schools in the 6-8 middle school and Yes. And that may be, in that piece may come separate of, I mean, that, the, that may be a domino that can be removed um, from the rest of it that can be dealt with and not have an impact on the overall. Um, depending on, on our, you know, how we come up with what our solutions are. If it's a lease office area and re, you know, configuration of ASC to, to support uh, operations, as an example, or, you know, some type of combined format, I, you know. But we wanted to focus on what is impact to students and to classrooms uh, and, and, and instruction. Uh, as our, you know, as a four P, you know, because that's an, you know, the instruction, where we are administratively and how we are functioning is, is an important piece and, and it helps us organizationally and we want to be as efficient with our systems as possible. We also want to focus on what, you know, the instruction piece is and that's obviously the focus of the majority of that piece. So, but it is not forgotten or, or not in second. It's something that we continually are working on. And in FAC, we have been talking about it yep. from the Financial Advisory Committee, and um, it it does really feel like it can be a domino that can be pulled out, especially if if it went down a path as is uh, Todd was alluding to that if it was a, a lease property and, and reutilizing the ASC, um, that doesn't have to be done in conjunction with this particular project. It can be done earlier or, or somewhere just in the middle of it, uh, separated. But uh, that is something that the FAC, uh, Todd can allude to, uh, to is that um, we have not let him forget about it. So. As, as part of the evaluation process of, um, you know, looking at the six through eight middle school model, is there evaluation of what the domino effect of what it will look like um, in, in the 20, like the 21st century learning uh, in the classrooms that are freed up and how, how buildings will be utilized? I don't think we've gotten that far yet as to what that would be. I don't. I mean, we haven't necessarily engaged, you know, from instructional side per se, what that would look like, you know, with the building principles as to, you know, because we've we're just getting to the point where we're at the numbers, um, you know, and I think that that until we have a a more detailed direction, I think you know we we wouldn't want to spend. We want to know we were headed, you know, absolutely in that direction and had a definitive path um, before we spent a considerable amount of administrative time evaluating on that. I'm sure the principals individually have already been thinking about how that would work and what they might do in reallocating and relooking at their building. Uh, I would be surprised if they hadn't. But, you know, as a directive path, we haven't necessarily discussed it. Fair enough. Yes. <laughs> 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 this is the super coach. Yeah. It's something we're still working on. And it will likely not look exactly the same in every building, depending on a bunch of other factors that could be Do we have somewhere where all that information is stored or could be stored? I don't, I'm not trying to make, this is already a huge project, but on top of that, of why flexible seating is important. Why all these, because again, this is, I wouldn't know any of this stuff existed um, unless my sister taught in a different school district and I've seen it, or that I work in early childhood now where I'm seeing all these new things come. And so getting, That's your question. getting that information about why all these things, you know, because you're going to look at a price thing and be like, STEM, STEAM. I, my dad probably does not know what STEM is, and if you throw steam in there, he's, and then you throw stream in there, and people don't know the difference of things, where, where is all that education and research going to be so we can be presenting it to people? Well, where it's going to be, I don't know exactly where, where right. it would be. We so do have, I mean, that, that's one of the core that's, conversations sure. you're going to have here with your community yes. as it relates to the, the six eight middle school model is going to be an important part of the conversation the other yes. part is going to be the value of um, flexible learning spaces the value of collaboration spaces why this generation of students needs that kind of environment 
to best be prepared for high school, for college, wherever they go in their career. There's a lot of research, there's articles. I will tell you, you can't point to and say students are going to score better on right. their eighth grade test if they have flexible furniture. Right, and I can pull a right. but, research article that says the complete opposite, but at least to have, I mean, I think it is very important to show why these are going to cost $14 million or $55 million versus can't you just play with magnet tiles in your classroom? <laughs> Because that only costs $150. Mm -hmm. I do like this. Well, I think that's going to be a big part of why we're, you know, engaging in a third-party consult. We're not trying right. to do this on our own because, uh, and by engaging with somebody who's worked with our community before, we can. They would take on. They can role. help us communicate not only costs or these kind of things, but big picture impact on on what things mean to students and what things mean. Uh, to property value, what, all those different things, and how each individual stakeholder group could be impacted. Thank you. I'm sorry to beat, beat yes. a dead horse, but um, take a draft plan to the community for uh, September through November. What is the draft plan? That's like the soup to nuts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a, a deeper version of, of this. Of everything. Mm -hmm. not, not, not the honed after community engagement. That's like the... Correct. Cause it, cause, right, because the community engagement process, if you, we engage in third party, you take... Sometimes Some time. it would be a couple months, I would suspect, to go through that And they'd process. be going through this, doc this document. That would be one of the things that right. they're reviewing. Right. But again, it's not going to, that document's not going to have exactly what a, a, a STEM lab is going to look like in each individual right. school, because we're not there yet. Okay. I don't want to go down that, don't go down that That's an expense right. that we don't need to Because granularity in. costs money, right? Yes. Yeah. So we, yes. we have very, very rough estimates. Right. And so there are parallel efforts of engaging the community and letting the community guide us, but there's still a lot of work to actually develop that plan. Right? We, we will hang on to the word draft for a while. Okay. Yeah. When we go out to get the community feedback between now and September, October, whenever that's all happening, um, kind of like what, what Greg was mentioning before, um, you know, we have this big picture number, and that number is going to be whoa, that's, you know, that's a lot. People are going to be kind of overwhelmed. But I think if, as we go out for community feedback, are we, is it possible to have some sort of a rough ballpark figure of, you know, let's say we, we want all this. We want this big number. Um, what's that going to look like on, uh, what's that going to look like for my, my house? Is that going to be available for yeah. them before yeah, they yes. provide their feedback? I think yes, that's important. Yes. Yeah, because I think yes. they're not going to be able to give it a, a good, will. accurate evaluation of what they think until they know how it's going to affect them personally. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll dive a little bit more into the details. So regardless of six through eight, wonderful furniture, STEM labs, everything that I, I think is a great idea, but there's stuff that we absolutely have to do regardless as a district, and, and we have that 300-page document, and does that total up to $115.6 million, or is that a different number? I would say that given your condition, well, yeah, I'm given the condition of the buildings, the minimum baseline is 100, as configured today, in operating today with 13 buildings in the format, the minimum base is 115 million on maintenance and roofs, electrical, plumbing, so on and so forth. And that's a 10 year horizon. And that's a 10 year horizon. There's an additional piece of, we, yeah, when we talk about the air, the air quality, air conditioning, and part of that in that, that 60 million number, let me go back to that, is the, you know, updating of safe and security and the vestibule changes and so in bringing those areas, you know, that entry into the buildings into a more current format of what we traditionally see in, in updated buildings, um, you know, educational buildings today. Um, and, in, you know, what, I don't have, you know, we don't have it broken down yeah. in so but that number's in there as well as part of that 60. Um, you know, 115 doesn't do anything about air conditioning or hmm. changing those vestibules. That's just keeping the But is it as coming. simple as saying, like, we should be spending $11 million per year on these improvements, or is it $5 million next year and then 
five year five, you got to spend fifty. Or how does that? Yeah, you know, there's. It's not. It's not quite that simple. I know that there's about twenty million dollars of that one fifteen. That is roofs that are probably years six to ten. That are at that point where you know year six six to seven years from now. We need to be spending about twenty million dollars on roofs. There's money that needs to be spent before that on roofs that need to be replaced in the next three or four. You know, if, I should say, if we're not spending it, we're we're living on borrowed time on those roofs. You know, it's a matter of time as you know we're repairing and putting money, good money after bad on them, but we're going to need to replace them. Um, I know twenty of that is, you know, on the other side of that six-year mark. Yeah, to give you an estimate, and that's only because I went through a spreadsheet of, of, of numbers and found that piece and remember that piece in the back of my head. I don't think I could remember much of the rest of those numbers in there. But, you know, so it's it's a little more complex than oh, breaking that. out. Of course you can. Just one more. <laughs> so we don't end up, much like the strategic plan, in a situation like this where we're needing every roof 150. Is part of the facility plan that once all this is done, we would have a something that would fit into a strategic plan every four to five years? Mm -hmm. This, These are the schools that are going to be this. This is the 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 systems that need to be updated here. So it's more like with the cur curriculum update that we're looking at things more regularly? I, I think as part of, I think as part of our annual budgeting process, and it's something we actually talked about briefly today at our, at our uh, retreat, was getting to a model that we're starting to, and looking at in a five-year model each year, what are the items, what's the long list of things that we need to be addressing, how we're gonna deal with it. Um, and, and and because right, you don't want to go every ten. Well, I mean, it's been I don't know when's the last referendum. Um, you know, there's a lot of this that 115 that is deferred maintenance. Right. Um, I mean, some of that the district has borrowed and put on additions and adjusted and done some of that work along the way um, in three, four million dollar increments, um, but has not been able to. And have the resources to really tackle some of those pieces. Any other questions? I think then the question that I have for the group is: I think we really need to talk about uh, a next step in in moving forward. And Tracy, you brought it up. I, I think you're absolutely correct in the fact that we need to be engaging with a communication consultant. And I. So if there's consensus on the board, I'd really like them to start getting that final quote together and uh, a timeline and a plan uh, together to do that. Uh, yes. Great, please. Yes. yes. Okay. Now, uh, just clarification from the Board of Education. Obviously, um, one of the main targets of that work will be um, Paul, who worked with uh, District 99, who um, I, I think we're all in agreement did a, a really nice job. Mm -hmm. um, do you want uh, the administration to simply go to Paul? Would you like us to go to multiple people so then you can have kind of a, an estimate? Um, there's advantages, obviously, to working with someone like Paul, who knows our community very well, who obviously we, we've seen his track record. Um, but would the board also like to see other potential uh, partners as well so you can kind of have a frame of reference? I know that District 60 recently successfully went mm -hmm. to the community and was able to raise the money that they needed. Um, I'm not suggesting that we ultimately engage them, but I think we would benefit from hearing how do other communities also engage. Mm -hmm. We can't just copy and paste a 99 model for mm -hmm. ourselves, and I'm not saying that we're going to go down that path, but we will have to customize our approach to our story, our needs, which is very different than a two-building district. Mm -hmm. um, just so. I think at this point, it doesn't make sense for us to be tunnel vision, um, and so I'd like for us to be able to engage a couple of stakeholders, especially stake, uh, sorry, a couple of uh, consultant mm -hmm. groups, especially those that have a track record of seeing a playbook that has worked in multiple communities. Mm -hmm. If that is Paul, and he's able to show us playbooks from multiple communities, then that's great. If that is uh, other districts that have had successful uh, efforts in, in recent years, then let's go with that route. But. 
I think multiple makes sense, at least at this stage. Thank you. I, I would echo that perspective. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. With that, we have, we've come to the reception of visitors. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended for a time of members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticisms of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We encourage you to keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, uh, have we received any cards? No. All right, so we have not received any cards. So uh, with that, if anyone is interested in speaking, please step up to the podium. We will ask that each person um, state your name and your attendance area and then provide your public comment. Uh, good evening, Chris Hamley. Uh, I have a son who will be attending uh, Herrick next year. Um, some comments on the uh, master facilities plan. Um, Darren, I'd like to disagree with you. I don't think it's actually complete um, as a master plan. Um, specifically, obviously, the, the focus should be on uh, the schools and the learning environment, but the administration uh, buildings are a big portion of that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the tradition of how Illinois is governed, that topic has been kicked down, the can has been kicked down the road for as long as I've been attending board meetings. Um, and I think you're going to have an opportunity, um, a narrow opportunity to engage the community on spending, let's face it, upwards $200, $250 million over a, a good portion of time. Um, I think it would be a mistake to not include the administrative buildings in that discussion and in that overall number because um, I can tell you from my discussions with the community, um, you're not going to get many choices, chances to, to get this kind of process um, approved or, or ratified. So, um, you know, I think there still needs to be some work done on that aspect of the master plan. It's, it's not something that I think should be separate or left out. Thank you, Chris. And just to give uh, a little bit of clarity, if I implied that I thought anything was complete or fully separated out, that was not my, my intent. Um, that's why I, I think it was said pretty well that this is going to be considered a draft f for some time. So, but thank you for your, thank you for your feedback. Okay. Appreciate it. So my name is Ami Johansson. I am, my children will, or are attending Pierce Downer um, Elementary School. So my comment was for the earlier presentation of MAP scores. So I have mentioned this earlier at the Superintendent Council meeting. Um, I do not think we do a good job of helping parents understand MAP, map scores. Um, I consider myself somebody who has a pretty clear idea what MAP scores are, and even I was very confused what to do with my kids' MAP scores. Um, I think, well, I'm glad that we have more instructional time in the fall, but the loss of those MAP scores is even more confusing to parents now. So the spring MAP scores were given to us basically as semester ended, or as the um, school ended. Uh, no one talked to us about those MAP scores. No one's ever, I'm a kindergarten parent, no one's ever talked to me about those MAP scores. They're just there. And I feel like if we're spending instructional time on the MAP scores and if teachers are using the MAP scores, parents need to know how so we can be partners. Um, so I do think there needs to be more done to connect parents to these MAP scores and our students. What do they mean and what should we be doing with them? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good evening. Uh, I'm Craig Young. And uh, well, for the first couple parts of my comment, I'm the president of the DGEA. And then I'm going to kind of speak more as an individual. Um, but the first one is uh, welcome, Dr. Russell. Thank you. Uh, very nice to see you here. Um, 
I was really impressed with your transition into the district and your efforts to engage stakeholders. Uh, meeting specifically with the DGEA was really meaningful to us, so thank you and, and welcome. Thank you. Um, request to get these presentations that are up here into the board agenda so that um, uh, those of us in the audience, we can kind of follow along. Um, I really like to use my iPad and take notes, um, but the data one and then this uh, really impactful facility planning one was not in the uh, the board agenda on the website, so I would, I would really love to have that uh, posted on there or, or some other way to share that with us. Um, all right, so now I'm just Craig Young, fifth grade teacher, um, sharing my own personal opinions regarding the facility plan, um, which is enormous, um, and the dollar amount is enormous. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that we're exploring all the options that are available. Um, I think yeah, you know, the strategic plan called out uh, the feasibility of those six to eight middle schools, and I think that's certainly uh, one idea to explore. Um, but I'm remembering back to when there was the Highland kindergarten issue, and there was um, a, a multitude of options. And in fact, the board act actually combined two different options to find a solution that worked best for the district for that uh, part of the community. Um, and I feel like this plan is just, I mean, that was one school's kindergarten, and this, this is like the most massive thing um, that I've heard this board consider. Um, so maybe we want to think about, you know, what other ideas are out there. Um, you know, obviously boundaries would be one thing to think about. Um, these are just ideas I've just thought about while I was sitting there listening. Um, but sixth grade cent centers or preschool centers, um, I mean, what would the cost be to just demolish every single school and like go to like four buildings? I know that's ridiculous, but I, I really, if we're going to go to a $245 million plan, like what, why not explore everything that's out there? Um, I, I just feel like uh, that's, I'm, I'm probably trying to spend a billion dollars here, but um, I, just, <laughs> I, just feel like, I just feel like it would be worth it to really explore every option before we, we decide on one and before we engage the community in one path. But, the, you know, just me speaking as an individual. Um, and then the other thing was just um, I haven't spoken to this board uh, as a whole yet, so please do feel free to reach out to me at any point about anything that, that you would like to discuss. I'm happy to uh, talk with anybody, so please feel free. That's it, thanks. Thank great. great, thank you so much. And I think you bring up a great point in that as we engage the community, we're not just the community, but it's all stakeholders and we're gonna take in as much information as possible. So. Anybody else? Okay. Everybody comfortable moving forward with that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, next up we have the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in your packet of materials? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the June 5th, 2019 meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the June 5th, 2019 meeting as presented. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items the board would like to have considered separately? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personal, the personnel report, financial statements consisting of the list of bills, and a summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. Our recommendations for action. The first thing up is the contract for the DGESP. Is there a motion to approve the 2019 through 2023 contract with the Downers Grove Educational Support Personnel, IEA and EA, as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. 
Aye. Motion carried to approve the 2019 through 2023 contract with the Downers Grove Educational Support Personnel, IEA and EAS presented. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a proposed tentative budget for the 2019 through 2020 approval of the tentative budget. So is there a motion to approve the tentative budget for the fiscal year 20, the fiscal year 2019 through 2020 as presented and make it available for public inspection at the ASC office and on the District 58 website? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 2019-2020 as presented and make it available for public inspection at the ASC office and on the District 58 website. Is there a motion to establish the date of the budget hearing on Monday, September 9th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. I motion carried to establish the date of the budget hearing on Monday, September 9th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at Downers Grove Village Hall. Is there a motion to adopt a resolution approving proposed amendments to the DuPage West Cook Regional Special Education Association Intergovernmental Agreement? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Not so much of a discussion, but I think it's helpful to educate what this item is that we're about to vote on? Yeah, it, I'm not, it, I'm not it, best it, positioned. It, it gave me a headache uh, yeah. <laughs> looking at this. So I, I think it would be worth kind of summarizing the sure. content. So this is our agreement with, um, with, with SASID. Mm -hmm. And it is basically uh, because we are a voting body, we have to approve any changes that they want to make. And m a lot of it was language, uh, renaming uh, a couple things. There was also an opportunity for smaller districts to kind of combine together um, to have voting rights that, uh, that they didn't have previously. Not for the most part, with the exception of some of the naming things, none of them really have a direct impact on our district here but we are required um, to vote for it. So I don't know if you have any No, I, I would concur. There's nothing in this uh, resolution that I um, would say puts the district at risk or in danger. Um, I would consider this more of a formality of being a member of um, SASIN, but nothing that gives me uh, concern. I don't think, Jessica, you have any concerns with this resolution either. We are one of how many voting members? That I don't know. The 90, the 92 districts. 92. 92. Does it just tend to go with the unanimous vote typically? Or, yeah, okay. Anything else? No. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution approving proposed amendments to the DuPage West Cook Regional Special Education Association Intergovernmental Agreement. Um, is there a motion to adopt revisions to policies 5100.2, health, eye, and dental examinations, and 5100.3, students with chronic infectious diseases? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to adopt the revisions to policy number 5100.2, health, eye, and dental examinations, and 5100.3, students with chronic infectious diseases. Is there a motion to award the bid for ink cartridges, drums, and print heads to Genesis Technologies for an estimated annual cost of $47,202.42? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go around. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for ink cartridges, drums, and print heads to Genesis Technologies for an estimated cost of $47,202.42. 
Is there a motion to award the bid for the Kingsley swing installation and site work to Hacienda Landscaping of Manuka, Illinois at a cost of $104,242? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I, I, have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, just so the public understands, the um, this is a, a, an issue at Kingsley with the drainage or something? Yeah, I'll let Kevin speak to it a little bit more. but Just um, to flush it out so that people understand why they're getting this. Correct. One of the reasons why. The was there a pun intended with the flush it out? Exactly. <laughs> but on the phone. <laughs> and, and Kevin, I'll let Kevin go in detail, but this area, Kingsley in particular, um, has some drainage issues. And when we consulted with our architectural firm, uh, this was the recommendation to permanently fix this problem. If, if any of you have been at the swings at Kingsley, I know we have Mel in the audience, um, she will tell you that that area floods. But I'll let uh, Kevin go ahead and uh, explain a little further. Yeah, so to elaborate a little more on the project, uh, I think in the packet describes kind of typical swing replacement project. Uh, Older swings in the district, a lot of them have been replaced. Older pea gravel, a lot of them have been replaced. Uh, Kingsley primary area is the only area left that's both older swings and the pea gravel still. So for instance, um, Bel Air has newer swings, still pea gravel. So the initial cost estimates are usually lower, you know, uh, maybe 50K. Um, we engaged White to make sure that we uh, were meeting all the uh, ADA requirements uh, that maybe we need to check into for sure. Um, as you can see, once they took a look at it, um, you know, the cost estimate was increased from um, roughly 50K up to, up to 90 with the drainage line. So a lot of the improvements isn't necessarily playground equipment, but, but site improvements. Um, so that's, that's where the majority of the, over half the cost is coming in is, is the sidewalk uh, that goes up to the, the western door, um, also the drainage line. So hopefully that answered a couple of questions. And is that something that's looked at, like, is, is there other area, other schools that are on a list that there are issues, or is this the one that was, like, at obvious glaring? Yeah, I guess another way of asking is, is there, like, a road map or a schedule of what schools we evaluate and kind of what needs are going to pop up sure. in the next 10 years? and then. Yeah, so um, over the last probably 10 plus years or, or so, um, the goal has been at, at all the sites to remove the pea gravel and to remove the older swings. So this would continue, and, and Kingsley has both of those factors, um, whereas the other schools only have one. So I was trying to think of another example, maybe El Sierra on the south side, the south side of El Sierra. Um, the pea gravel has been removed, is now mulch, it still has old swings. So we need to work continuously on getting rid of both the swings and the pea gravel. And then, as everyone knows, then the, the PTA, has, most PTAs have been fundraising for the actual uh, playground structures themselves. So the swings and the pea gravel has been a operations and district cost for the, the majority of the projects um, that have been replaced over the past uh, 10 years or so. Okay. And, this, just, and that, I guess, gets to the question of what's next or what would be next on the list of the roadmap per se? Yeah, I, I think when we, you know, when we see a memo that says playground award, I'm thinking, you know, stuff that I could send my kids to and have them play around. But as, you know, you kind of read the memo and, and hear your explanation, it's more curbs and mulch versus stones. And I guess, you know, as we kind of engage with the community, one of the things that always comes up is playgrounds, and it's kind of top sure. of mind for a lot of individuals. So how do, how do we kind of arm ourselves with information as to what that that plan is to kind of tackle what's next on the list or um, what the next few things are on the list? We, we can share. Uh, we already have the spreadsheet of which schools um, have the older swings remaining. Okay. Um, it's just kind of a weird... Um, you know, the schools that have newer swings still have pea gravel, and the schools that have mulch have older swings. So you can definitely share that out. Yeah. Um, Kingsley happens to have both of those. Yeah. And so that's why it made sense to, to go now and, and, and be number one, and all these others need to follow very soon after. Yeah, and I'll just speak for myself. I'm not saying that we don't do this and, you know, fully approve it, but I guess um, it just 
playgrounds is a very sensitive subject when it comes to equity and, mm -hmm. and how we engage our community. So anything that you could help us kind of uh, communicate what that plan is. And how the evaluation yeah. process works. So you explained what I know Kevin has a, a I asked Kevin for, for this information as well and he was able to provide with me a, I would say it's still in uh, draft form we'll clean it up for the board but uh, I can definitely include that in next week's update for the board and then should you have subsequent questions we can continue to uh, to fine-tune that document so you can use that for our community we can also share that um, with our community as well so everyone's aware of what the district is, is trying to tackle playground by playground to make sure that we get that equity awesome super thank you so much thank you any other discussion? All right, uh, Melissa, please go on. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for Kingsley Swing Installation and Site Work to Hacienda Landscaping in Manuka, Illinois at a cost of $104,242. Is there a motion to approve the renewal of the agreement between District 58 and Knowledge Universe Education for the period of July 1, 2019 through July 30th, 2020? I'm sorry, June 30th of 2020. And this is the Champions Agreement. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? The, the only question I had, and actually I didn't have until I looked at it again now, is, is are the pricing, is the pricing changing or is that exactly the same as what it was this year? Um, that, they set that themselves, so I can't actually answer that for sure, but I'd be happy yeah, to answer it. It's going up from last year to mm -hmm. next year. I know that we've increased the time a little bit, but I can, I can get those prices for you. And that's something to... Um, I'll be happy to include in the, the next update so you have that information. The uh, question that I had was on our on our Monday schedule for next year, mm -hmm. right now the times of hours of operation all say 255 onward, but for our Mondays we'll have a 2 p.m. release. Yes, we'll, they are aware of that for sure. They're aware of that. Yeah. Is there something that we, uh, what are we approving the contract today? Are we approving the, the renewal, the, yeah, so that they can continue to operate within our buildings. Okay. Is this something that we can do to reflect the hours of operation in the their contracts? Yeah. Absolutely. I'll open it. Okay. Anything else? All right. Please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the renewal of the agreement between District 58 and Knowledge Universe Education for the period of July 1, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Is there a motion to designate the following items as surplus equipment? A John Deere SX85 tractor, a John Deere GX95 tractor, a Toro Snowblower 624, Toro Snowblower 824, Toro Proline 36 inch mower and a pneumatic floor machine. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to designate the following items as surplus equipment. John Deere SX85 tractor, John Deere GX95 tractor, Toro Snowblower 624, Toro Snowblower 824, Toro Proline 36 inch mower, and a pneumatic floor machine. All right. Uh, we got a couple announcements. Uh, please make note of the dates here. We got a regular board meeting at Village Hall on Monday, August 12th of 2019. And we have a budget workshop followed by the board self-evaluation uh, over in Longfellow, and that will be on Monday, August 26th, 2019. At 5 p.m. Oh, at 5, that one will be at 5. Process one. Okay. All right, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to cl closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees in the district? 5 ILCS 122C1. The placement of individual students in special education programs 
and other matters relating to individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10. Litigation when an action against affecting or on behalf of the district has been filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal or when the district finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into the closed meeting minutes 5 ILCS 122 C 11. The discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for purposes of approval by the body of the minute. Uh, by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by section 2.06 5 ILCS 122 C 11. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move to closed session after a short recess at 920.